Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are finishing our discussion of clinical pharmacology of inhalational anesthetics, and this is recording part three. Now we're going to talk about malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is a biochemical response that's triggered by certain anesthetic drugs in susceptible people. It occurs in the skeletal muscles, and it's a genetic defect with autosomal dominant inheritance. The incidence obviously varies depending on what kind of population you're dealing with. In general, they say between 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 50 or 60,000. This is why we always ask for a family history, because any closely related family member to someone who knows who's known to have MH has to be considered MH susceptible until proven otherwise. What if a patient has had anesthesia before without a problem? You need to remember that patients have died of malignant hyperthermia even though they've had multiple prior uneventful anesthetics. So the fact that they've survived anesthesia before is no proof that they don't have MH. If you have reason to suspect MH, you should take the proper precautions. How do we determine, how do we diagnose MH? Well, the definitive diagnosis is called the caffeine halothane contracture test. This is the gold standard. To do this, you need to go to a specialized biopsy center, of which there are only a few in North America. They need to take a muscle biopsy and test the muscle specimen in, in a lab there at that center. There is genetic testing, but it cannot definitive, definitively rule out MH because there are so many different mutations. So you could rule in MH, but you can't really rule it out. There is a small association between heat stroke and susceptibility for MH. So a patient who is susceptible to heat stroke, you may want to be concerned for MH. What are the triggers for MH? All volatile anesthetic agents and succinylcholine. Can you give nitrous oxide? Yes. Can you give all other IV medications? Yes. Those are the only two categories of triggers. When patients have malignant hyperthermia, what's happening is calcium is being released abnormally from, uh, the, from inside the muscle cell. And this leads to a sustained, constant muscle contraction. Often people notice masseter muscle rigidity in the jaw. Even if you gave more succinylcholine, which would be a terrible idea, or even rocuronium, the rigidity will continue because the problem is not at the neuromuscular junction, it's inside the muscle cells. This constant contraction leads to hypermetabolism. The muscles are working overtime and heat is generated. The cells become hypoxemic, hypoxic, leading to hypoxemia in the blood, which leads to acidosis, increased PCO, PACO2, and tachycardia. The muscles eventually become damaged and this leads to break, breakdown of the cells called rhabdomyolysis. When the cells break, then potassium is released into the serum and it can be so high that patients can, under, can have a cardiac arrest. We also see increased levels of um, creatinine kinase, which is another substance inside of muscle cells. Patients can develop arrhythmias, myoglobinuria, and eventually renal failure. MH can occur in the OR or postoperatively, and 25% of people who have an episode of MH will have a recurrence within 24 to 36 hours. So therefore, they will need monitoring for some time after the episode. If we have a patient who we think is at risk for MH, we should avoid all triggers and should flush the anesthesia machine according to the protocol at your institution. If a patient uh, seems to be developing MH, the first step is to stop triggering agents and call for help because you're going to need it. The mainstay of treatment is dantrolene, 2.5 milligrams per kilogram IV. Dantrolene is a muscle relaxant and it reduces that calcium release within the cells. Dantrolene has to be dissolved in water and it's hard to dissolve, so you'll need help just so people can uh, dissolve those 10 or 12 or 15 vials of dantrolene that you're going to need. Other, there is dantrolene now that's available in a special concentrated form and all you need is one syringe. Some of you may work at centers that have that dantrolene, which is much, much easier and faster to give. Malignant hyperthermia is also treated with high flow oxygen to wash away all of the triggering agent as well as 
to oxygenate the cells. The patient may need active cooling with a cooling blanket, with ice packs around the head or the armpits or the axilla the, um, or the inguinal region. Uh, treatment of the acidosis and the electrolyte abnormalities, they will almost certainly need to go to the ICU. And we recommend that you call the M House hotline, Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the US. You can call them or go to their website, mhouse.org. There are some clinical situations which may sound like MH, but they really aren't. One example would be, for example, for example, a young patient has undiagnosed muscular dystrophy. This usually happens in boys because it's X-linked, uh, and the clinical presentation often doesn't happen until they are six or seven years old. So this younger patient gets anesthesia, has a hyperkalemic arrest, and dies. This isn't true MH. This is due to the muscular dystrophy and probably is related to the succinylcholine the patient received. Another example is neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS. Those patients don't need any MH precautions. This syndrome happens when patients receive antipsychotic drugs like Haldol. But look at what they get, hyperthermia, muscular hypertonicity, autonomic instability, mental status changes. It sounds kind of like MH, but it's not, and there doesn't seem to be any significant crossover between these two syndromes. We will get patients who get masseter muscle rigidity. This is trismus, where it's difficult or impossible to open their jaw because of tight muscles. And patients can get mild or transient masseter muscle rigidity in response to succinylcholine. And it happens in about 1% of children who receive halothane or sevoflurane plus succinylcholine. But we always worry that it could be MH. And so in general, if you get masseter muscle rigidity, you probably should assume it's MH. It's probably safer to treat and be wrong than to not treat and delay the proper treatment. Most people, if they see masseter muscle rigidity, they'll cancel elective surgery and bring the patient back another day. Technically, masseter muscle rigidity can be bad enough that you get muscle damage, which leads to rhabdomyolysis. Most of these patients should be monitored in the hospital. We should watch them for signs of rhabdomyolysis, including myoglobinuria and my myoglobinemia and check those levels and electrolytes every eight hours. That's it for this discussion. Please let me know if you have any questions, and thanks for your attention.